Hey, good afternoon or evening, depending where you are. Um, I'm Renee Barrio, Head of Curatorial Affairs here at the McNay Art Museum. Thanks for joining us for our first virtual Artists Looking at Art presentation. And I'm really delighted to be joined today by Ruben Luna, a colleague of mine here at the McNay's and an artist. And um, welcome, Ruben. Thank you, Renee. Nice to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with our, present, our program, Artists Looking at Art, uh, it's about 20 years old now, and we invite artists from our community to present work here at the McNay, and that includes a program where we get to discuss the work and have a little Q&A session and learn more about the artists and the work. We really want to celebrate the diversity of our community in San Antonio and the area, and also to celebrate the artists who live here and make this their home. Um, so again, welcome, Ruben. Thank you. Um, first of all, so you work here at the McNay with me. I work here at the McNay. I'm the art installation manager. I've been here for about six years now. So what does that mean, art installation manager? So I uh, work with the preparators to install all the artwork. Do you uh, actually get to touch the art? We actually get to touch the art. Uh, I've been a preparator for 20 years. Wow. I've worked at other institutions here in San Antonio, but uh, I love it here at the McNay. So, uh, but my duties primarily include artwork coming into the museum or working with the collection, uh, doing the installa installation onto the wall, working with you on right. the layout, the design, things like that. So, yeah. so you're, you find time to be an artist as well? I find time to be an artist. So um, we're going to talk about your art in just a minute, but I want to just, for some people who don't know you, mm -hmm. let's just talk a little about your background, where you're from, where you went to school, that sort of thing. So I was born and raised here in San Antonio, Texas. I uh, went to high school uh, at Central Catholic. Um, uh, then I went to uh, junior college. I went to San Antonio College uh, for a while. In the art department? Uh, I actually started uh, in a different, I didn't know really what I wanted to do. Right. Uh, I ended up taking some classes at SAC. Uh -huh. uh, while I was there, I was taking some, a drawing class and outside in the hallway on the bulletin board, there was a ad for a preparator. Uh, I didn't know what th that was. Uh, but it had the skills like working in the shop, you know, things that um, I had grown up doing. Uh, my dad had a uh, company, he, he had a sheet metal shop, an air conditioning shop. So I kind of always was around working with my hands, working right. with him on the summers. Um, so when I saw that ad, I was like, hey, I can do that. And it was working at a museum. And I thought, wow, that'd be great to work at a museum. And it was for the Witty Museum. For the Witty. Had you been to the Witty? Did you know I that? had not been to the oh, Witty. Okay. So it was, you know, just kind of that idea of like, wow, working at a museum would be kind of cool. Not really knowing what it all entailed. Uh, again, um, it just kind of seemed like I could do the task. Right. And so once I went for the interview, they hired me right on the spot. Uh, I kind of gave them my background. And so uh, I went to work for them and I dropped out of school. I worked for the Witty for about two years, then moved to the San Antonio Museum of Art. And then from there, I kind of just worked my way up. I started off working in the, uh, in the wood shop. So I had different positions. Uh, I spent about maybe a year and a half in the wood shop. Then I moved into doing lighting, uh, things like that. But, um, you know, they just kind of rotated me into doing So you had to learn the, kind of the breadth of all the different yeah, parts of the job. Yeah, so it was more than just hanging art on the wall. Right. So you kind of, you have to learn how to do labels, how to do lighting, right. how to make mounts, how to do electronics, how to do AV, um, just kind of a little bit of everything. So. And then you, didn't you go to UTSA? I went to UTSA afterwards, uh -huh. uh, after I decided, hey, I want to stay in museums. Okay. So I knew to move up to the next level in management. Uh, I was a uh, project coordinator at SAMA. That's, I had moved up to that position by that time. And I, I was working more in the office and working in processing invoices, things like that. So You're working more of a hands-on person. I'm more of a hands-on person. I can do both. I can kind of jump in and out. And, but I kind of wanted to work in towards being a uh, an exhibitions manager at some point, right. but I knew I needed that education. So I went back to school, went to UTSA, got my degree in art history uh, from UTSA. And um, from there, I moved to the Alameda Museum. I became an exhibition manager and I was there for about five years. And then I went back to the Witty and then I came here. Wow. So, so it's been That's great. kind of a- So you've seen how everybody does it. Yeah, I've seen how everybody, you know, they, they do their, 
they do their thing a little bit differently, but you know, it's pretty much the same. So, so I'd imagine a lot of the skills you kind of learned in the in this these jobs mm -hmm. have helped you in making your art. Absolutely. Uh, I think I kind of looked at my time working at museums as sort of my art school, you know, being able to have hands-on, you know, prior to working in a museum, I had never met a, a working artist. So that kind of helped me, you know, talk to artists and how do you do that? How do you stretch a canvas? How do you mix paint? How do you do that? But also on the other end is kind of the carpentry side of it. Um, you know, fine woodworking, uh, sort of like some of things that I put into my artwork, you know, doing the structure that goes into building something like this. You know, there's a lot of little intricate parts that, you know, I have to either, uh, you know, cut out the parts, make, the, make sure everything fits properly, uh, the attention to detail. So everything is really, I learned how to display objects. I mean, more than anything, how to bring artwork into the museum ready for, you know, displaying them, you know. So you're presenting three pieces in, mm -hmm. uh, in our program. Are these all recent pieces? So the, the last piece I'm going to talk about is recent. Uh, I did it for uh, ALA. These two, uh, this one I did it in 2017 uh, and the other in 2018. So uh, we're looking at the work and it's on top of a pedestal. What's the name of this piece? So this piece is a uh, portrait of my abuelita, my grandmother. So this uh, piece, I, I, I consider it a portrait of her. This is the first of these portraits that I made. Um, they, they're objects that symbolize or they reference something that were very, uh, you know, that when I look at a broom now, you know, I kind of rem remember my grandmother, you know. So I kind of took these objects and kind of assembled them to, to uh, develop this portrait. Okay, let's talk about the objects in the, in the case first and ask some questions. So did your grandmother own these objects? My grandmother did not own these objects. Okay. So they're, they're replications, in fact, similes of things that she has, Absolutely. right? Yeah. That you've gathered. Mm -hmm. And I assume that each of them has a symbol, as a symbol of Bach, right? Yes. So why don't you just tell us, kind of dissect it for us and tell us some of the symbols. So um, first of all, it's in a seven up um, case. Did you make the case? I made the case, I made all the interior, uh, and then I, uh, I attached the, the seven up case itself into it. Uh, all, the, all of this was done, you know, woodworking that I had to do, and then I went in and flocked everything. So, so what uh, does that mean, you flocked it? So flocking is sort of a, uh, this material that's kind of a suede mm -hmm. that you see in jewelry boxes, right. uh, you see in other types of like guitar cases, things right. like that. Uh, they're used to protect the objects whenever you're carrying them. Right. So, uh, so I did the flocking. Uh, added all the hardware to it, um, you know, the smaller details like the corner, to protect the corners, these corner brass pieces, uh, the uh, latches. So, you know, that, that was all the exterior of the pe that went into constructing this piece, but on the interior side of it, the objects, uh, this broom is actually my, one of my mother's old brooms. Uh, and what I did to this one so that it fits in the box, it sort of uh, assembles so you can uh, like a pool cue, like a pool cue. So it kind of, and so I did all of that so that it all fit. And once you take it out, assemble it, it's a full broom. So what does the broom symbolize, or does it? So the broom. So uh, this, every one of these objects, my grandmother, when she came over from Mexico, uh, she brought over her folk uh, medicine practices. Right. And so the, the, some, a lot of these objects are used for that purpose. Right. So for example, the broom was to do a cleansing. So if you had a, um, if you wanted to do, if you had uh, a certain fear or if you just were feeling out of sorts, they, my grandma would say, go bring me the broom. And she would lay you on the bed and then she would do sort of a ritual over you using the broom to sort of cleanse you. Right. And so, uh, you know, that's one aspect. Uh, the, the other way is using the egg. Uh, that one I think is a lot more common in, in um, where they, they use, in my family, they use it with kids, uh, smaller kids who were, um, who were a little fussy. Uh -huh. They had trouble sleeping. 
they said, go bring me the egg, and they would do the same sort of thing. But on that end, they sort of referenced that maybe the child got the evil eye, uh-huh. el mal ojo. So they say, go bring the egg. And so then they would do the, the same sort of ritual. And talking to other people, uh, they, when they see it, they're like, oh, you know, my, my grandmother did that, my mom did that. You know, they all have a different variation on, on how they did it, but still pretty much the same. And were they using prayers as well in the... Yeah, so they do, they recite certain prayers. Okay. And, so it's kind know, of a melding of Catholicism and absolutely, folk medicine. Absolutely, absolutely. Right. Yeah, so um, I'm from South Louisiana, yeah. and we have the same culture there, yeah, where you, absolutely. Meld, you meld those two mm-hmm. things, and it's, so I, I'm getting yeah. exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. Uh, and, um, and these are very powerful, very yes. powerful rituals. Mm-hmm. Um, did they perform them on you? Yes, they did. So my grandmother lived with us for uh, many years. So, you know, to me it was very common uh, in our household. We were a big family. Uh, whenever, you know, somebody... Uh, for example, the, the other one is the susto here, which is the salt. That is like if you got some bad news and you were shocked, they say, go get the salt, you know, and give them the salt to kind of get them out of that state. So it, it was almost sort of like a, it was very common, go grab me this, go grab me and that. And was it like a particular drawer of salt or is it any no, salt? No, any salt, okay. just, it, just the household salt, you okay. know, table salt. Okay. And so as somebody who who would have a cut, they say, go get me a Band-Aid. For us, it was very like, go get me the 7-Up, go get me the salt, go get me the egg. And did, did the kind of tradition or the, the, the these, uh, rituals get passed down? I mean, did you sort of learn Absolutely. from somebody? Absolutely. So uh, and my grandmother, she learned it, it from her grandmother. And so on the, on the, in the pueblo, on, on the ranch that they lived on, uh, this was something that they just passed down, that it was, they didn't have doctors, so these were things that they, you know, but it went beyond this, um, where it went to, you know, specific herbs, you right. know, that they used. Right. So there was a lot of healing, uh, but these particular objects are things that my grandmother used primarily on me. Right. You know, right. so these are what you associate with. Yeah, and so, like I said, like, we're in another family, they might say, go get me a Band-Aid, to me, this is almost like a spiritual first aid kit, right. you know? And so um, the, whenever I see that salt, it still brings me back to when my grandma would say, go grab me this or go grab me that. And did she pass it down to someone else in your family? Yes, she actually passed it. My, my mom now sort of, uh, she's not as, um, she doesn't have the no, the, as much knowledge, uh-huh. but it was so common that she picked it up, you Lovely. know, over time. So. Even with my nephew, uh, he had an instance where he got scared and it was like, go get me the egg, and they went and performed the whole ritual. So, you know, I'm hoping that it will continue to pass yeah. down to the generations. Yeah. yeah. Uh, oh, were there we, any questions? Yeah, before we move on, so we have our, our colleague Natasha who is fielding questions, and let's see if Natasha has any questions. Hi, you actually did have some really great questions come in. Someone wanted to know what the technique was used on the egg. Okay, so they're asking oh. about the technique on there because there's a very faint yes, image Yes, actually, right? uh, so this is a portrait of my grandmother. Uh, so what I used is carbon, an old carbon uh, printer or uh, copier. Uh-huh. And so I take acetone and then I cut out the object or the, the print and I'm able to transfer that. Is that a real egg? That is not a real egg. Okay, I was it's wondering. Not a real, yeah. And so, for example, that technique, that's something that I learned early on uh, working at, when I first started at the Witty, uh-huh. is that before we did vinyl, uh, we you had vinyl, graphics, vinyl lettering graphics on lettering on the wall, like we do now for our entry uh, into the exhi- text. Right? Yeah, the text. Uh, we had a gentleman that would come in and hand paint everything. Oh, wow. And so he showed me this technique where he would take that acetone, transfer it to the wall, and then he would trace Beautiful. it. So, you know, those, that's another example of, of learning different techniques to, to make more art. Natasha, is there any, another question we can answer before we move on? We did actually have another question mm-hmm. asking if there are any specific pieces in the um, collection or in exhibitions at the McNay that have inspired Ruben since he's a staff that's member. That's a great question, because I also have a question with that. So, yeah. Because uh, you get to handle them, so you have I a different have to relationship handle to them. them. Uh, in the, I mean, there's so many great pieces in the museum. I mean, uh, one of them is 
Cesar Martinez's work uh -huh. uh, that we ha I don't know the title, but Cesar was sort of my entry into the art world uh, because I remember being in high school and I had a catalog for a Chicano art exhibition um, and his work was in there and it really inspired me because I had never, it was the first time I had seen somebody who looked like myself in a, in a, in a book in art, of art. And so that sort of led me down this journey of, of learning about Cesar, but then learning about other artists like Luis Jimenez. Right. And, you know, just, it just kind of sent me down that rabbit hole of researching who these artists are. And so now in storage, when we're moving things around, and I see Cesar there, and it's like, you know, I, I kind of... And you know him. Right? And I know him, so yeah. I've just, met him a few times. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Let's go to the next one. Mm -hmm. But before we talk about that, I want to ask you some questions. Mm -hmm. Uh, some other questions. So, um, you know, often artists are asked, like, who do you look at? Who are your favorite mm -hmm. artists? That sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But what, 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 what in life inspires you, right? So, mm -hmm. like, not like not another artist, but something that what do you what what, what well, fuels the work? One thing that fuels my work is my family. Obviously, you know, all these are about my family, but also my my spirituality. All of these have a spiritual component to them and so um, other artworks that I, I, I've worked on in the past or I'm working on in the future it always tends to go down that path you know because uh, you know I went to Catholic school my whole life I kind of uh, left the Catholic faith came back and then you know my spirituality just kind of seems to always come into into my artwork and um does, I want to ask you, how big your family is? Your, I mean, your media family is it big? My my media family is very big. Uh, my extended family is even bigger. Uh, so, it uh, I have three sisters and two brothers. Uh, my father's side, the, he has ten brothers and sisters. My mother's side, they have uh, one brother, which is one of the artists or one of the portraits portraits that I have here. And then she has four sisters. But then it just sort of there's a lot more of us, so. So what's the name of this piece? So this one is Portrait of Papo Aike. Uh, Papo, which is a grandfather, okay. is sort of a, uh, a term used. Um, so it's this, just, the, the connection is not, this is my wife's Papo, okay. uh, her grandfather. And so when I started creating this piece, um, this one was more about um, sort of a, a different take on spirituality where he wasn't a church going man, uh, but he had a certain spirituality about him uh, with his uh, with his garden, with his with his trees. Uh, you know, there was just something about him that he wasn't a traditional uh, church going right. person. Uh, but he, you know, he had his his objects, you know, with him and, and what do we have? We, I think I saw uh, there's a Guadalupe. So, so here, here, here's a Virgen de Guadalupe, uh, little statuette, and then also Saint Michael. Saint Michael. Okay. Um, so when he passed away, uh, he was a uh, you know blue collar worker, construction uh, union worker, and I got his uh, some of his lunch boxes and his tools, and he had all these stickers on them from his union or from the Dallas Cowboys. He was a big fan or uh, of radio stations and things like that. So on the back of this, and the public probably can't see this, but uh, there's stickers kind of to, to signify that. Um, but the pull stick, when I was dating my wife, uh, sort of to see, uh, you know, to size me up, if you will, uh, he wanted to play pool against me. Uh, and the fam her side of the family had a, um, a, uh, a, a a, a bar that we would have family functions at and they had a pool table in the back and he was like hey you know let's play some pool let's drink some beer so he got to we got to know each sure. other and so I obviously got the bless his blessing and so that's why the pool sticks were in here and then th these would be items that I would envision him uh, you know getting off of work you know going to the bar having his beer you know before going home but also that that you know, that moment where we both sort of got to know each other playing pool. So, um, the first one, um, mm -hmm. 
my grandmother. She's no longer alive. She's no longer alive. And, she and passed and away in 1990, and he passed away in uh, 2004. Okay, beyond these three pieces, are there other portraits in this series? Uh, no. Okay, no, so no. these are the only ones? Yeah, these are okay. the only ones. Okay, and we'll get to the third ones, mm -hmm. okay, because um, I had a question. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's very clear to me when I look at this work is that you love these people very dearly. Mm -hmm. They're very important to you. Mm -hmm. Just the way you take such... Uh, care to present them mm -hmm. and you, that care comes through so beautifully um, and just the way that you've kind of um, take these simple things that are maybe not maybe don't have a lot of meaning to most people or some mm -hmm. people but but they're clearly important mm -hmm. in the context of this yeah. this person mm -hmm. so uh, on here just like the egg is a portrait of Papua there on uh -huh. the cigarettes and uh, so you know, in the construction of this, again, if you look at it, um, this one had more woodworking in it. Uh, the corners themselves, you know, everything needs to be nice and tight because they're not going to be covered by the flocking. Right. A lot of that can be hidden underneath. So, so this one, I took a lot of care and detail in the assembly of it. Are there other artists in your family? Yes, my brother, he's an artist as well. He's the uh, owner of Presta House Gallery. Uh -huh. So. That's in Southtown? Yes, in Southtown. And did your parents encourage you to be an artist? Uh, actually, yes. My father very much encouraged me. Uh, he was the one that said, hey, um, go be an artist. Go, you know, when I was at SAC, he, he was just like, go take classes, see, see where it goes. And sure enough, you know, it led me to And did you it. think you could have a career like in the arts? Mm -hmm. Absolutely not. Really? You know, it's almost kind of what I always say is it's almost like saying, hey, I want to be an actor or I want to be, you know, it seems so like... Kind of you know, remote. The, yeah, Just kind of remote. And I never knew, met an artist in my life. You know, I didn't know how they would make a living. And so once I worked at a museum and I got to meet these artists, I said, hey, that is possible. You know, they're doing it, you right. know. And so it was just a matter of just, just doing the work, you know, and everything just kind of, you know, happen. Right, that's great. Let's move on to the third piece. Mm -hmm. Oh, but look, let's just say Natasha, do we have any questions on this piece? So we've actually gotten a few questions asking more about the materials. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, some are asking in general what materials Ruben uses in all of his artwork. Mm -hmm. And then someone else is asking about the outside of the boxes, like mm -hmm. as a, like the skin, and if you could speak mm -hmm. more about that. Um, so, the type of materials I use, um, I use uh, so uh, just whatever uh, like poplar material, which is something that we use in like museum um, on our pedestals. So it's a wood. It's poplar a wood, wood. Poplar wood. Uh, it's a softer wood, and it doesn't show as much grain. Uh -huh. So it's easier to stain. It's easier to work with. Uh, some of, some of it I use some panel. Uh, which would have a smooth finish on it too, so that when I go to flock the artwork, uh, it the paint adheres better. How does the flocking? Is that a spray on? So the, the the flocking process is it, there's several ways, but the the most simplest form of it that I use is sort of a uh, it's a paint that you paint on, okay. and it's a uh, it's an oil based paint, uh -huh. and when it when you're applying it it kind of has a self-leveling uh, element to it okay. so that you don't see any streaks. Right. Uh, that's just part of the paint. And then uh, you take the, the fibers and you put them in a tube, almost like a syringe. It's like a, a cardboard and you just puff it onto it. And it adheres. And it, 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 it sets on it and then after, when it dries, you shake off all of the, the remaining... Not too unlike when you flop a Christmas tree. Exactly, yeah. What about pretty... the skin on the outside so of this the one? The skin on the outside, uh, this one is a Lone Star beer uh, case, and I don't know if I can turn it, but... Um, you, can it... Only, you can turn it, you have to turn it back. <laughs> yeah, so, <laughs> so it, uh, this is... Uh, the interior, again, is just... Um, again, it, it's just the, the paneling. And then I just use the actual, uh, the beer carton. So they're cardboard. They're cardboard. Kind of collaged. Collaged on onto yeah. it. Yeah. And the objects inside, obviously, you don't make those. You buy those. So I, I buy them. them I source those yeah. exactly. Yeah. So it's not not it's not like you're 
replicating all of these no, objects. It's no, the real and, thing. And that's another question people have asked me, or you know, more than anything, like, are these their objects? Right. And they're really not. I, I consider them. These are, you know, they're not so much things that they carry, but more than things that I carry inside. You know, sure. so. Okay. Let's go to the third. Okay. Right? So, um, who is this a portrait of? So this one's a portrait of my tío, my uncle. And so, uh, is he still here? He recently passed away. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, so when, um, when I made this piece, he was still alive. He passed away two months ago, uh, back in June. And so, but when I was creating this piece, uh, you know, I kind of had this, I wanted to take a different take, um, you know, kind of representing, um, sort of who he, who, how I remembered him, uh -huh. you know. We, he was a musician. Uh, he was, the mu music coming out of there's here. There's music in the back uh, playing, and originally it was gonna be playing on the cassette player with some headphones, but due to COVID, we had to remove right. uh, the headphones. So uh, we had to come up with an alternative uh, for the audio, but the, the cassette player does work, and that's the image of him, uh, that's a cassette there. Uh, which I was going to have playing, uh, but in the 80s he had some success uh, in Mexico. Uh, he played conjunto type music, um, and is this his music we're listening this to? This is his music uh, that's playing right now. And so the the story I always like to tell is um, he had some records, and I remember going to uh, the Kmart uh, here in town, and we were walking through with my grandmother, and actually. My abuelita, that's, his, their, that's, that's her, son. her son. Okay. And we we're walking through the Kmart, and in the bargain bin is a uh, record of his. And we were like, oh my goodness, he's made it. Like, you know, it was just, wow, it was just one of those moments that I'll never forget. That's great. And so when we would go visit in Mexico and we'd have uh, family functions, you know, he'd bring out the guitar and he'd play, and, you know, he was just like this larger than life character, you know, it seemed to me. Um, you know, but he did live sort of a, a, a rough life after, after, you know, the 80s, 90s, you know, he, he didn't have as much success, he, but he continued his life as a musician. He played, uh, you know, in, in restaurants. And Was in he bars. based here in town? No, he lived in Mexico. Oh, he lived in Mexico. Yeah, in different parts of Mexico. Uh -huh. And so, uh, but here in San Antonio, whenever I see a musician like at Mi Tierra, things like that, I always think like, wow, you know, I kind of think of my uncle. You know, and just, uh, you know, just that musician life, you know, and, right. and understanding, you know, as an artist, I understand how hard it is to make a living, you know, as a musician, you know, I can only imagine the same struggle, you know, and so I kind of always had that sort of connection to him, you know, as, a, as an artist. Um, and so when I went to, um, to assemble this, these works, you know, I, I when I'm, when I'm working on them, I sort of have to curate the objects that are going sure. in there. And so it, it sort of evolves after time. You know, it's in a Stetson hat box. Right. And so the first concept was that there was going to be a, an actual cowboy hat in there. And then, you know, I kind of, as I start working through the process, you know, I thought about the neon. But I, for this piece, I wanted to create more of an atmosphere, uh -huh. you know, right. versus, you know, I kind of, I, it's kind of like a story, like I envision him getting ready to go to work. Right. You know, and so that's why these objects that I have, um, that I had selected for this, this is a Tres Flores, which is a uh, hair tonic. Uh huh. And so, and then the, the comb, and then this is a, um, like aftershave? Like cologne. Uh huh. This is cologne, and then that's a tequila bottle. Right. And then his ring. So, you know, he wasn't, um, my grandmother always tells a story that he was just kind of, she never knew where he was at, you know, and so she would do a blessing to the north, the south, the east, and the west. <laughs> to hit him somewhere. So where it'll hit him, you know, it'll catch up to him somewhere. Right. And so, you know, he kind of was, you know, a rascal kind of, right. you know, and so, but when I envision his, his work or this piece, I kind of envision how my, when my grandfather and my father get ready to go to church, you know, they, they comb their hair and they put on their cologne. I kind of envision him going to his work, you know, right. going to the, uh, 
to the restaurant or the bar and that's his sacred space sure. and just getting prepared to go do what he needs to do. So, you know, he wasn't a spiritual man, a church going man, but you know, there's an element of spirituality that I kind of, you know, I could see, you know, in him. In, in his own way. In his own way, yeah. So, um, do you think you make more portraits? So yeah, I want to continue this. And then uh, one thing I want to point out on this one is sort of how things have evolved. Um, these are more, the objects in here are more pressure fitted. Uh, so I used a computer uh, router to cut these uh, pockets out. Right. And where I'm able to slip in the, uh, the objects in themselves. So it, there's sort of been this evolution of, of how to cr actually create the right. piece itself, right. and so I want to keep exploring this, you know, aspect of of using the computer router to to, you know, continue the. And is the scale important that they be kind of intimate like this? Uh, well, I think what what really drives it is the the container itself, right. like the hat, um, the Stetson hat, really drives the scale sure. of the objects, and then also the story that goes into it, you know? So in working with it, it's just like this back and forth of, you know, I have all these objects and they might fit, but some might not talk to the others. So I might eliminate some and until they're sort of all feel right and then the story sort of come, evolves out right. of it. You know? Where's your studio? Is it in your home? It's in my home. So you can so, work all the time? So I work all the time. I primarily work, you know, after I get out of here, I work at home. Uh, I always have projects going where I'll start one, uh, you know, leave it, come back to it, think about it, uh, which is, was very much the case of this one, where I kind of had to think about where this is going and, you know, it just kind of evolves and becomes what it is. Let's see if we have any questions. Natasha. Great questions that just came in. Okay. So Caroline Wiggins on Facebook wants to know more about the ring on this work of art. The ring? The ring, uh, so the ring itself was uh, sort of a good luck ring. Uh, again, I kind of saw him, one of the last things he would do would get ready and then put on his ring and then go it's out. A to, you know, it's a horseshoe, it's a horseshoe, right? It's a horseshoe ring, yeah. So, so that's, you know, just kind of a... But I love the way you made it in the center. So yeah. our, our, the focus is all, that. Exactly. everything radiates from the ring. Exactly, yeah. So... That's a good question. Um, the Brizzle on Instagram. They want to know, Ruben, what three objects would you put in your self-portrait? Oh. That's a lovely, that's a great question. Ah, <laughs> uh, jeez. I wish uh, I had thought of that question. Uh, I'm not sure. Um, uh, and think about what, case, what kind of casing it would be in, too. Yeah, like, I mean, that's, a, that's a, a great question. Um, I don't know. Um, so self-portrait. Yeah. That's next. Yeah, that, that would take some time of kind of some self-reflection and seeing, you know. I think again. it's there. Yeah. You can I do think, it. <laughs> yeah, it'll come. I don't know. I, I would really need to think about that. It'll one. come. But it's a, good, it's a good challenge now. Yeah, it is. Uh, maybe I might take that one up. <laughs> we have another question? Yes. So this next question is, um, do you continually collect the objects for future works, or do you bring them together for a specific piece when you're ready to create? Oh, that's a good question. So is your, your studio like a flea market, uh, just full of stuff? Actually, or? yeah. I mean, there I do have sort of a windowsill where if there's an interesting object, I'll, I'll find it somewhere on my dad's workshop or somebody, and I hey, can I have this, and then I'll, I'll set it there. Sort of like the Tres Flores, which a lot of people have asked me about, like, as soon as they see it, a lot of the guards that work here, they're like, oh, Tres Flores, wow, you know, and they still use it, you know, but they are, there's, a, there's a connection to that. And I would see that in my home. And so when I, I saw one, I was like, I don't know what I'm going to do with it, but I'll set it there. Right. And then eventually I'll come back. But sometimes you have to source things, right? Sometimes I have to source things, uh, sort of like the, the cologne. Uh, that was actually, my father used a cologne similar to that. Uh -huh. You know, that's an Avon cologne that right. was very popular in the 80s. And so that I had to source, you know, to, right. to find something from the 80s that, that, you know, it just reminded me of that. Cool. How are we doing? We have time for more questions? I have about three more. Okay. 
Okay, this next question is for Ruben. Do you listen to music when you work? And if yes, what kind? Yes, uh, so I do. So when I actually was working on this piece, I, and I don't know if I can play some of my uncle's music. Oop, they just stopped. It just stopped. So when I was doing this piece, I was playing his, his music. Uh, my mother had some of his cassettes, so I was just playing them and just kind of, you know, connecting with him at that time. So uh, same thing with Papo Aike. He really liked conjunto music. So I put on, you know, the AM conjunto channel and I would just listen to that. Nice. You know, just kind of get into that whole spirit, you know. Right. So. How do you go about acquiring and installing neon in your work? Uh, so again, this is another one of the skills that I learned. When I worked at the Witty, I was the electronic technician. So a lot of, they had a lot of electronics at the Witty, a lot of touching you know, gadgets. So my job was to go fix them. And if something, um, you know, a camera or a push button or, so I had to, they taught me the electronics portion of it. So when I went to do the neon, I purchased this neon. Uh, it had other elements to it. it was, it's a bar. So it was uh, a pre-made you know, sign. Pre-made like pre sign. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's a beer sign. Right. So it had a lot of uh, text on it. So I had to take it all apart, rewire it, and then run it safely inside the box, make sure everything uh, connected properly. And so, again, this is another example of using things that I picked up along the way to, right. to kind of incorporate into my artwork. Right. Right. Well, do you have anything else you want to share with us? I mean, no, thank I you. You really that. shared a lot of things, and I thank feel you. like you we, we got some really good insight into it, to how you work, but not only how you work, but what you're thinking about and, and the, what motivates the work. And, and it's really beautiful work. Um, and I know that um, your, your, your uh, family would be, if they were here, they yeah. would be so proud of these yeah. pieces to, that they were, because they would be so connected to them. Yes. So thank you so much. Right. Thank you so much. And thanks to everybody who joined us today and look for us in, in for future um, virtual presentations. All right. Bye-bye. Good night. Bye -bye. Thank you.